Greetings, everyone. Aloha kako, and welcome to today's keynote address by Dr. Sarah Werner. I'm Valerie Wayne, and I'm very happy to be here with you from Honolulu. A few housekeeping details before we get started. This is a Zoom meeting, so everyone can be seen and heard. Please mute your microphone and turn off your camera if they are not turned off already. To ask a question, please use the live Q&A feature on the right-hand side of your screen when viewing in the platform. If you prefer to ask a question live, please raise your hand and I will ask you to unmute yourself when we are, when we are ready for your question. Keep in mind that we may not be able to get to everyone with a raised hand. If you have technical difficulties, please use the live support button at the top of your screen and one of our specialist team members will assist you. To view this session on a large screen, please click the arrows in the top right hand corner of the video where I am now and the screen will be enlarged. It's a real pleasure for me to introduce you to Sarah Werner, who is the author of this important book, Studying Early Modern Printed Books, 1450 to 1800, A Practical Guide, published by Wiley Blackwell in 2019. It introduces readers to how books were made during the hand press period and how to find and work with those books today. Sarah calls this a, a baby Gaskell, and it's so accessible and so concise that every time I go to a section in this book, I learn something new. I think that's probably true for a lot of us. There's also a companion website called earlyprintedbooks.com that is a response to her belief in the value of openly accessible library resources and a desire to create something that can draw users in to explore libraries on their own. Dr. Werner is also co-editor of the journal The Papers of the Bibliographical Society of America and the author of numerous articles on book history, uh, digital tools, and library outreach. Those include her article Book History and Digital Scholarship with Matthew Kirschenbaum in Book History, and working towards a feminist printing history in the journal Printing History. Her earlier scholarship focused on Shakespeare and modern performance and her book Shakespeare and Feminist Performance, Ideology on Stage from 2001 is still taught and cited by scholars. Dr. Werner worked at the Folger Shakespeare Library for nearly a decade as undergraduate program director and as digital media strategist and she is now a consultant working with special collections libraries to encourage teaching and collaboration with students and faculty using rare materials. She identifies herself as an independent librarian, a title she made up to describe her work raising awareness of the value of public and student engagement with special collections libraries. She says it's like being an independent scholar, except that instead of focusing on creating scholarship, she works on building resources for us in and with libraries. That focus means she has a lot to tell us about how bibliography can become more inclusive and more productive. Her talk today asks the question, what's the power of feminist bibliography? Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sarah Werner. Thank you. Um, I want to start by um, extending my thanks to Nigel Bond for the invitation to speak um, with you all at this conference, um, to Amelia Lowe for her tremendously helpful assistance on all things um, uh, technical, and um, many thanks to Val for that really lovely, um, that lovely introduction. It's always such a joy to hear that the book works the way that I was hoping that it, that it would work. Um, just a, a quick note, if you're looking at me on Zoom, you should see the slides behind me, but I believe if you're watching over on the portal, they'll be side by side. It works either way. Um, I thought I would start off by just defining some of the terms uh, that are in my title uh, and that I'll be talking about. And the most important one to begin with, I think, is feminism, um, which people define differently. So I want to clarify what I mean by feminism. For me, my feminism is inclusive. It's inclusive of race, of gender, sexuality, nationality, ethnicity, religion, class, ability. And I, I given um, uh, current events, 
especially in the UK and in the United States around um, trans individuals. I really want to stress that um, trans and gender nonconforming people are part of um, my definition of feminism. My feminism is always political. It's not just saying women do this. It has a political purpose to it. And that political purpose is always striving to improve the world. Um, it's a pretty broad definition, but I, I, I feel pretty strongly that it's an important aspect of my feminism, that it is this, that it is this wide. Um, I should also define bibliography, um, which I, I was gonna say, I feel less emotionally attached to, but I think that might actually not be true. I spend so much time thinking about bibliography. It's a little bit, I think even trickier um, to, to talk about, and I'm interested in a really specific aspect of it. So one of the forms of bibliography, I mean, this is a, um, you all are bibliographers, you will grasp these differences, but nonetheless, I'll, I'll spell it out. Um, there's typically what we encounter and when we teach our students, a numerative bibliography, the cataloging of books, the lists of books, counting books, all of that sort of work. Um, it sounds like I'm moving along a ladder, I realize, as I'm reading this, and I'm not sure I mean to have it have a trajectory, but we can talk about that, I suppose, if we want. Um, then there's descriptive bibliography, which is not just listing books, but describing their physical characteristics. Um, this is the sort of bibliography that I'm interested in. Um, I'm always interested in the material text, and that means thinking about how a book has been made, how you describe how it has been made. And then the next step, um, analytical or critical um, bibliography, as it gets called, which is making the interpretation of the material text signs that you see. So not just saying this book um, is missing a gathering or this book has leaves inserted in this place, but then taking it to the next step and saying, and this is maybe what happened in the print shop, that this is what this means um, and attaching some sort of meaning to it. Uh, the most recent type of bibliography that I have started to think about is a, is a very recent um, term that Derek Spires introduced um, us to um, as a concept in his uh, January 2021 um, address to the Bibliographical Society of America annual meeting, and that's liberation bibliography, um, which is, if you're hearing similarities to liberation theology, those of you who um, are familiar with that will see where this is going. Um, liberation bibliography is a sort of critical bibliography that is explicitly interested in recovering uh, the, the minoritized and um, hidden from white mainstream views um, of texts and writers. But it's not just saying bibliography needs to include the long history, for instance, of African American print. It is also really about liberation and really about making that access to bibliography, making that access to these past texts really meaningful. Um, Spires talks about it uh, primarily in terms of race, because that is his area of focus. He's um, has done really great work on Black print culture. Um, but I think that we can also think about liberation bibliography in terms of any sort of um, political movement like feminist bibliography. But I find it really helpful because it takes us in this sort of list that I've just done of counting up of different types of bibliography from just listing the existence of books to moving to thinking about the power of books um, and how they work in the world, um, which is not only the topic of your gathering, but always basically what I'm what I'm interested in. Um, so the other thing that I want to start off is to give you a little bit of the origin story of this project for me and thinking about feminist bibliography, because it'll help explain sort of my perspective and the questions that I'm going to want to ask in this. Uh, so and, and many, many years ago now, um, I started teaching at the Folger, a course for undergraduate students to be exposed to early modern books and to bibliography and to print culture and to that whole thing that makes up book history. 
Um, and I spent a lot of time teaching students and struggling with Gaskell because that was the only book that was out there and eventually got to a point where um, I sort of was convinced that I needed to write um, Baby Gaskell, as Val pointed out. I, I, I do still in my head think of it as, as Baby Gaskell um, in all the ways in which babies are good for certain uses and not great for other sorts of uses. Um, and as I was finishing up this project, I became very aware that despite the fact that the vast majority of students that I had taught were women, and despite the fact that my academic career had started off thinking really explicitly about feminist issues, I felt like I had sort of dropped them from this book. Um, it was a, it is, still is a book about, um, it's a book about printing presses. It's a book about technologies. It's a book about how books are made and what uses we make of them. It's not a book about book history that doesn't talk about printers, um, except as almost disembodied agents that move these machines around. But it's, it's not sort of saying like, here is the history of stationers in London. Here are the printers in um, Mexico that were the earliest going. And I started to really wrestle with how do I talk about bibliography in a feminist way? How do I turn that into a feminist practice if I'm not trying to recover women's history and not trying to say, here are the earliest printers, here are these women who did these amazing things. How do I move forward if I'm thinking primarily about um, machines and not, and not people? And one thing, I did try to cite more books um, that were written by women. So, the, so my book is full of examples of, as you can see in this early printed book, here's an example of a you know, canceled um, a canceled errata. And I thought I did such a good job of um, including more women in that period and um, scholars now who write about this book. But then when I went through and I counted up as I was indexing my book, I counted up my citations. And even though I was being really conscious about um, citing women, it was horribly lopsided. It, I, I didn't, it wasn't even sort of like for every one woman, there was two men. It was like, I, it was maybe sort of a three to one. It was very frustrating for me because I thought I had done better. And it made me all the more aware that what I wanted to be able to do was to think about bibliography in a way that shifted the field, um, that shifted what questions we asked of books, what books we look at, and really explicitly how we invite people into um, the world of analytical bibliography. Uh, my answer at that moment really ended up to talking about pedagogy and feminist <laughs> pedagogy. Um, and I still think that that is a really compelling answer that if you teach in a way that encourages students to ask questions and to be led by their questions, as opposed to teaching in a way in which you say, here is all of this information that you have to master, um, book history and bibliography becomes much less intimidating and it can be a very intimidating field. Um, and what as part of that pedagogy, also looking at sort of different categories of books. And instead of focusing on what um, my students sometimes always really wanted to look at, which is, you know, the sort of big important books, um, the first editions and the pristine copies. And here's Caxton's Chaucer, I'm saying that, but I'm not sure I would let my undergraduates really spend a lot of time manhandling um, a Caxton. Um, but instead looking at the sort of everyday used, ragged, common books, almanacs, and those little um, broadsides and sort of pamphlets that you don't get in literature classes. Um, but as after I stopped teaching and started thinking more about the physical presence of books and how we work with them and how we know what it is that we're doing with them, um, I thought, well, pedagogy can't only be the answer. I wonder if there's something going on where I can still think about technology in feminist terms. So that's the sort of background that I'm coming in um, to this question. So it's really not really um, focused on individual women and women's history. It's really focused on trying to bring a feminist sensibility to these material objects. I think, here we go. So we'll back up. Um, and do a little bit of a, um, a sort of orientation to descriptive bibliography. 
because once I started really thinking about what it is that it's doing, I started seeing patterns in there that I wanted to question. Uh, the origins of descriptive bibliography as a practice, a conscious practice as opposed to um, a piecemeal thing that's happening, really comes from 19th century efforts to turn the description of books into a science. Um, that is a repeatable objective process that builds on visible evidence as found in the material object itself. Um, it made a lot of sense to develop a process like that. It means that when one person writes a, creates a description of a book, somebody else can understand that because they know the conventions and they know what to expect. Um, you can have five different people in theory working collaboratively on a project and they will all be following the same rules and we'll all understand what's happening with it. Um, and in fact, this sort of emerging 19th, late 19th, early 20th century bibliographical practices um, have been tremendously important in our understanding of how early print works. We have early printers manuals, but they're late by early printing standards. They're not going to tell us what's happening in the 15th or the 16th century because they're not really appearing until we're getting to the 17th and 18th centuries when technologies are already shifting. So if we want to know how books were made in that period, what we need to do is this sort of descriptive analytical bibliographical process of looking at lots of books and seeing what's on the page um, and how that can inform what we understand about printing. But understanding what we're seeing on the page is an iterative process that in descriptive and analytical bibliography emerges from finding patterns across multiple instances. That is, it assumes that if we look at enough copies of a book from the variations that we see across copies, we can deduce information about the printing processes that made it and the intent of the printers. What I'm showing you now is a particularly dramatic error um, that you're not going to see in a lot of books in which one side of a printing form was was overprinted on the other side accidentally. So you so the inner form um, is printed on top of the outer form as well as on its own in the in the inner form. Um, and amusingly, for those of you who like to think about early 20th century bibliography, this is a copy of um, uh, this is a copy of a Minta that was once owned by Greg, who gave it to the Folger Shakespeare Library as, you know, a sort of like, thank you for acknowledgments. Um, and I really love it because it's gorgeous and it's weird. Um, so this is a dramatic copy and you can learn things about the printing process because you can sort of imagine what would have happened in the printing shop that would have had the same text printed on two sides. And then I have all sorts of other questions about how did it actually get gathered into the book was the person who was picking up, like, how, did somebody not notice? I don't know how you could not notice that this had happened. Any case, um, there's also plenty of smaller changes that bibliographical, that bibliographers look for variations in headlines, um, the movement of broken type across forms, shifts in watermarks used in a copy of a book or in an edition of a book. Um, all of those things can tell us something about how a book was printed. And it's remarkable. I, I, just, I, I want to say this up front because then I'm going to go on to be a little bit mean about, about bibliographers. So I want to just say it's amazing how much we know about this, the processes and the actors of the early printing world that have been gone for centuries um, without leaving sort of the sort of instructions, we, the sort of manuals that we might want about first you do this and then you do that, except if you live in Belgium, you're going to do it slightly differently this way. That would be amazing if we had that. Um, and we don't. What we have instead is an incredible body of knowledge that was built up by these late 19th, early, mid, late 20th century bibliographers who have taught us so much about how books were made in this period. Um, so much so that somebody like me who was not trained as a bibliographer um, can synthesize all of that information, well, some of that information that's out there and um, present it in an understandable fashion in a book in a way that's sort of available to newcomers. It's a huge body of out there and incredibly grateful for that knowledge that has been handed down to us. Um, but the practices of descriptive bibliography, 
as a field are not neutral, just as the scientific method that it was striving to emulate is also not neutral. One example of this lack of neutrality, um, descriptive bibliography is a field that is only interested in printed books. If you're working with manuscripts, you are hopefully studying with a codicologist um, who will help you with manuscripts. Um, but it's not only that descriptive bibliography is only interested in printed books, it's a field that evolved initially from studying incunables um, with a real fascination of trying to understand who actually is responsible for which books. Many of those incunables are not, they do not have printer's names, they do not have um, the sort of imprint statements that we um, that became standard in later centuries. But it really hit its stride as, as a field um, with scholars who were working specifically on 16th and 17th century English printed drama. Um, so it's not a field that started off with the entirety of books, despite the fact that it's bibliography. It's not a field that even started off um, with an interest in the entirety of printed books. It's really coming from a very specific place. Um, and part of that reason is that Anglo-American bibliography, which is the tradition that I am um, talking about here primarily, uh, is driven by a fascination with Shakespeare. Uh, and I guess that's not surprising when I say it like that, but in fact, many of the earliest um, landings on bibliographical tools, ways of performing bibliographical analysis were in the service of trying to work out which of the printed plays of Shakespeare that have survived are the closest to Shakespeare's language. Um, which of them have been stolen by pirates um, and which of them have had Shakespeare's real meaning hidden behind the veil of text, the veil of print. Um, these, are, these are great questions to ask, but they are very specific questions that I think shaped this field. And one of the ways that it shaped it is that despite the fact that there was this insistence that bibliography, descriptive bibliography is its own um, is in its own service. It is its own scholarship. It's its own um, valid form of academic work. Um, it's largely been shaped by being in service to textual, textual scholarship. So that the reason why you want to be able to figure out how things were happening in the printing shop is so that you can understand which is the correct textual choice that an editor would make when preparing an edition of the text. Um, there's a lot of assumptions in there about what it means to prepare an edition of a text, which are not, um, let's see, not necessarily how we edit texts now, although I think it's mostly how most texts are being edited um, now um, with some sort of really interesting, some really interesting exceptions. Um, but it's interested in, in in setting the text. And it also means that it really kind of focuses on, um, it has a preference for literary works and canonical works, partly because that's what these guys were working on because those were the ones that presented the questions that they were really, that were really interested in. Um, and the other thing that they did is they really were primarily interested in books at the moment of printing, as opposed to when the books left the shop and ended up in the hands of a user. So I'm gonna look at a couple of, uh, sort of a handful. This is the, the, the more sort of like detailed, lots of pictures part of the talk. And then I'm gonna get into sort of bigger questions. But I wanna look first at um, some of the divisions that Bow, Bowers, Fred's and Bowers, our um, father of bibliography uh, made when working on this, um, building on his predecessors. And one effect of their interests is that bibliographers are only interested in texts that are printed on the common press. So in the Renaissance period, we've got two different types of presses doing the printing. We have the common press, um, which is what you think of when you think of the letter press in this period. And you can see it off to the, oh my God, I'm reversed. And so you can't even see my hand. Um, there's a man in the background pulling on the press. You see people in the front setting out letters. 
they're only interested in the workings of this press, which means that they're not at all interested in the many types of texts that came off of the rolling press, uh, which was used primarily for printing um, intaglio prints, engravings and etchings. You needed a huge amount of pressure. You had to use a different sort of press. Uh, printers specialized in one sort of press the other. You didn't really get, um, for the vast majority, you did not get shops that included both types of presses. Um, so it's a whole different world, but, um, in great, but intaglio presses, rolling presses, produced all sorts of things that we might think was relevant that have been ignored. Um, texts that were entirely printed on a rolling press, like music, um, have been left out of descriptive bibliography by and large because not so much because they're music, more because they're printed on the rolling press. And in fact, if, so this is a, um, a collection of violin solos held at Penn, printed in London in 1705. It is the sort of work um, given that it was printed in London that you might imagine be represented in the English sort title catalog, which catalogs works printed in English or in um, the United Kingdom and its then territories um, from the earliest printing up to, it has the cutoff date uh, for the ESDC of 1800. So 1705 printed in London should be in there if you look at violin solos in the ESTC, there will be five. Five are in there. This one is not. This one's not in there because there's no element of this book that was printed on a letterpress. The other ones that are listed in the ESTC are all either have notes like the subscribers list or the, you know, the, the privilege statement has been is in letterpress type, was printed on the common press. Um, there's or it has a statement saying, could somebody please check to see if this is all engraving? It should be in here. Um, it's a book. There's text. I don't know why music isn't, wouldn't be considered text, but it's been dropped out because it's printed on a different sort of technology than what bibliographers were interested in. But there are also books like this that have um, a combination of letterpress and engravings. I love this book. Um, this is a uh, Soldini's 1776 um, sort of speculation on the, the souls of animals. And, and it's kind of a little bit sort of like an evolutionary mess is the story that's going on in this book. Um, so a descriptive bibliographer would look at this book in front of her and she would note that the right-hand page of the opening is printed in printed on the common press, this letterpress type. Um, but the plate facing it is from a rolling press. And that initial letter, which is a Q, I think, um, is also engraving. So you could write a you could write a description of this book in which you would essentially ignore all of the plates and only focus on the description of the text. But what's fun about plates, of course, is that they're not integral to the structure of the book because they're printed on a different press. And so then they are joined together with the paper, the sheets from the rolling press and bound up and then you have a book. And with Soldini's book, this copy from the Getty, it's the same chapter, it's the same place in the book, but you might have noticed here we have a plate that shows a, a, a dragony thing in the background and some flying animals and that's a that looks like a pig to me in the front and this is has i don't know what that is in the background and in the front is kind of a really armored rhinoceros there are two different images that are happening in two different places in the book um, you might also notice that the, the colors of the ink of that initial letter, the letter is the same, but it's printed in different color ink. In a in bibliographical descriptions, those details don't figure into the book. They don't, they don't really matter for the purposes. Um, and it's it's partly about how do you handle that kind of um, movement when 
the usual description of a book is based on physical characteristics that can be compared, that can be repeated across copies. So there's a structural integrity and there might be leaves missing um, from say a volume of plays, but um, in other places, it might be there. It sort of fits together as a whole. It's, it's physically um, sewn together. With the plates, the plates aren't attached. They can be wherever. It presents a, a problem with um, creating a standard description. I get that. But on the other hand, if this was a letterpress feature, if this was text that appeared or didn't appear in different places in a book, um, we would have a way of talking about it. It would be addressed, it would be part of it. There's other weird things that happens even in letterpress books, um, and that's illustrations don't count, even though they're pretty and we like them. And even though things like this, this um, illustration of a corn cockle from a 1568, um, herbal printed by, um, printed at the Plantin shop. That gets reused in 1618 and another herbal from Plantin. And here we see it in 1633. A little bit confusing in this one because it looks like it was printed in London, but there was a, a close collaborative relationship with Plantin on this volume. Um, there are not, there are very few, in fact, it's really primarily Ruth Laborski who did all of the work on trying to come up with a bibliographical way of handling woodcuts, including repeated woodcuts. And this is really, this is a block that is the same block. We have the block, um, the, well, we, the Plantin um, Moretus Museum has the block to use across it. But once again, it's, there are financial and material reasons why this might be important to consider as part of a bibliographical practice. But given the emphasis on tech that we have and on um, letterpress technology, they've sort of gotten dropped by the side. Fugitive sheets with flaps that are often used to um, illustrate anatomy. Uh, this is from the Welcome Library. So actually all of these images that I have been sharing so far, these images of books are from the early printed books website that I have, earlyprintedbooks.com. And on that website, you could actually see the sort of earlier versions of that um, with sort of like the different levels of it lift. But you remember flat books, like when you're a kid, I remember flat books. That's what these are. But the flaps are separate pieces of paper that are attached, again, haven't come under sort of bibliographical consideration or these rotating disks that get used to um, understand um, astrology and navigation and to um, predict the future even sometimes. It's only been very recently that a methodology for describing and thinking about how these movable parts of a book should be incorporated into a description of a book. Um, and there's so, there's so little that we know about Lovell's. And I think in part because coming back to this bibliographical description, the emphasis has always been on the text. Um, and as a result, not much attention has been paid to how are these getting assembled? Who is doing the, at what point in the process do they get assembled? Who's doing it? Are there professionals? Is it the binder? Is it somebody else? Um, partly because of the influence of the history of descriptive bibliography, these are questions that have just mostly been put aside. So those are all things from the period that Freds and Bowers and W.W. Gregg and Beccaro were all focused on. The early bibliographers were focused on that hand press period. Those are examples that they fell out. That doesn't even take account of all of the printing technologies that have emerged since the hand press period, let alone since Bowers was writing in 19, the book came out in 1949. Um, this photo offset flyer presents all sorts of complications when you think about what's an original and what's text and what's image and are there, can you have issues in states and this sort of technology. Um, so there's, bibliography has not really moved past, honestly, um, the sort of interest that it had when it was originally formed. Um, 
Another example of the ways in which the early interests of bibliographers have continued to affect the work that we do today is that the aims of standardizing descriptive bibliography in the first half of the 20th century were really about being in this, explicitly being in the service of scholars as opposed to librarians or book collectors. Um, and it's amusing is maybe not the right word, but it's kind of interesting to actually go back and read Freitz and Bauer's um, principles for bibliographical description and read it not for actual, all those fine details about how you would describe something and how to understand states and issues and all of that. But if you read it for all of the other stuff that's happening in there, there is a lot of time spent on um, defending territory and creating boundaries that set apart bibliographers and proper, proper bibliographers from people who list books in other sorts of ways who aren't really doing what they're doing. Um, that emphasis on scholars, his book speaks to other scholars. Um, there's an emphasis on the book on scholarly expertise is what it takes to understand books, not necessarily field expertise. So librarians, although they might be handling the items in their collection all the time, maybe don't really understand the bibliographical features of them. I'm not saying this is true. I'm saying this is the perception that Bowers creates um, in his work. His whole, um, the whole book tightens, it's all about tightening a circle to create a community of bibliographer that excludes um, amateurs and Dilettantes is um, another one of the favorite words that they use for people who, who just sort of, I don't know who does bibliography as a dilettante. That seems like a weird pastime to me. Um, but the result is that bibliography created a circle in which they were speaking internally to themselves and not creating a pathway for newcomers to come into it. When you pick up these early um, manuals that are setting the field, and even when you pick up works of uh, analytical bibliography today, they are overwhelmingly full of details. Arc I, I'm gonna use the word arcane, even though I am the editor of a journal of bibliography, arcane details. Like they, even stuff in my period, there's stuff in there that I don't know when I read these articles. How would I know this? I haven't looked at all these 50 million things. And oftentimes it's presented as if everybody knows this, you can't even engage in this conversation if you don't understand these references that I'm dropping. The problem is that in the academic world, um, particularly in the United States, to a lesser degree in um, the United Kingdom, um, the academic world no longer really trains scholars to do bibliographical description because it no longer really values that work. So there's no, so bibliographers are off doing their thing in the circle, intense details, masters of so much information that is amazing. Meanwhile, the rest of the world is over here being like, blah, 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 this doesn't matter to us. And there's not much conversation happening between the two, in part because of the um, inability to cross, to talk across communities. So, I don't know what my slide is. Oh, I have a blank slide. Um, I want to shift, and this is where they sort of get into bigger questions and less details about books. I want to shift and I want to think about community. And I want to think really specifically about um, community and technology and to ask what communities are enabled by um, bibliographical practices and what communities are excluded from those practices. And in thinking about these questions, I turn to Ursula Franklin, um, who is not a bibliographer. Um, Ursula Franklin was a really amazing, I don't even know quite how to sort of like squish her life down into um, a, a string of characteristics. She was a German Canadian uh, materials engineer. Um, she was a metallurgist. She had a, a, just a, a super important, impressive career as an engineer. Um, but she also was a Quaker, was a feminist, was a pacifist, um, was deeply invested in how technology worked with people and the connections between technologies and 
um, being human, I guess is the way I'll put it. So one of the distinctions that Franklin makes about technologies is she, she thinks about them in two different categories. There's the holistic category of technology. Holistic technologies, it's helpful to think of them as being akin to how we think about craft. Um, it is a person who makes in makes, I'm just gonna use objects as my, I'm gonna use bowls, let's do bowls. It's a person who makes bowls. They start with the raw material, they make the bowl itself and they decide how it's gonna be finished and they decide how it's gonna be put out into the market. Um, it's worker directed, it's flexible. If something goes wrong in the middle of this process, um, that bowl maker can shift what they're doing and be like, oh, I need to, this sort of clay doesn't hand it to this shape. So I'm gonna have to make a different sort of shape when I do this bowl. Um, there's a lot of individual freedom and it tends to be specialization by product. So I make bowls, I am the fork maker. I'm not sure why I'm going with utensils. Um, holistic technologies work in contrast to prescriptive technologies, which are, um, it's easiest to imagine in terms of thinking about assembly lines and how assembly lines work in factories. Um, the individual worker, the person making the object, is, I guess it'll be bowls again, um, doesn't control what they're doing. They do they do one aspect of the process that they are told to do by the manager. They have an exact task. You are the person who mixes up the clay. That's all you do. You get it to the right standards and you pass it off to the next person. Um, somebody else down the line, it is their job to add um, little dimples to the bowl's edges. If the person before them has made those edges too thin and he can't put the dimples on the edges of the bowl, that's brings the whole process to a halt. There's nobody who could step in and say, oh, this is my job to fix this. Um, prescriptive technologies, according to how Franklin sees them, creates compliance. You do what the manager tells you to do. You do what the technology directs you to do. Um, there's very little freedom for handling and different sorts of aspects around it. I love this way of thinking about technologies because it makes you see that the technology is not in control of you, but you are also not in control of the technology, right? It's a two-way, it's a two-way sort of street. And for Franklin, technologies are not just machines. Anything can be a technology, a process can be a technology. It's the whole sort of system of working. So books, books are holistic technologies. In terms of how we use them, books are that you can read the pages in any order. You can disassemble a book if you want to. You can disassemble and reassemble a book. You could take part of a book and mush it together with another part of a book. Um, you could use books as furniture. And what we're looking at is actually <laughs> was staying at a um, hotel and they had a wall display and the wall display was this big Texas flag. And when you walked closer to it, you could see on the right, it's all makeup of books. So books for me as an object that you use, you would, you could do it. That's the amazing thing about books is you can do anything with them. You can use them in any sort of way. Um, hand press books, I think also are a holistic technology. Uh, the, it's not one individual creating the book from beginning to end. There's definitely a process and there definitely has to be standards in it. Everything has to be type height. You can't have one foundry making type at one height and a different foundry at a different height and then how would that work with the press? I don't know. But they have a huge amount of flexibility to make the book do what it is that you want to do. Um, so this is just a look at um, a copy of uh, Dominique Fertel's 1723 um, printing manual um, that the Folger has in which you can see that the it's, it has one plate that's extended on this end, and then you have the main part of the text next to it. And then there's another plate that folds out another way. So the book has to be this big, but they have this huge amount of visual information they wanna pack in. So you expand the book and then you fold it. And um, for me, that seems to be like a, a, a sign of um, flexible use as opposed to prescriptive. So, Descriptive bibliography is also a technology. It's a process for how we do things. 
Um, but it's a process that assumes that books are prescriptive, right? It assumes that books are, um, that books follow a standard order, that books are repeatable, that books are consistent, um, and that they are consistent enough that the differences jump out at you so you can pay attention to them, right? Um, and descriptive bibliography as a practice is, oh, is also really prescriptive. You as an individual can go and do whatever you want, but if you wanna do it properly and not as a dilettante, but as a real bibliographer, there are rules and there are conventions and you need to adjust your work to fit those. Otherwise it's not gonna make sense to the larger bibliographical community. But what happens if we think about um, bibliography as a holistic technology that prioritizes not the printer's intent from when it first emerged, but prioritizes user intent. Could there be a way of cataloging and describing an ideal copy of a book that didn't focus on um, how it emerged, but how it could have been used? This is a copy of Edward II um, from, what is, this is a 1622 Edward II that partway through the book, suddenly the printed text stops and you get this manuscript edition in this beautiful 19th century hand. And then after a handful of leaves of that, you switch over to a 19th century printed text of the play. Um, what is this? Oh, this is a great Bible held at George Washington University that has been um, heavily annotated by somebody using a blue ballpoint pen in the 1970s. It's an astonishing book that if you were to do, you would have no idea of books usage if you were just thinking about how, what was the printer's intent when it came out of this. Um, I'm speeding up a little bit because I want to get in a couple more examples before I run out of run out of time. I promise I'm, I'm paying attention. I don't want to make Valerie have to um, cut me off in two seconds. Um, I want to just look, just flip through really quickly a couple of, of maybe provocative examples that can help us think about how books as objects create communities in the process of their making. Um, this is a, oh, this is so hard to explain. This is a 1937 book called Bookmaking on the Distaff Side um, that was printed by a collective. Um, it, the, it, you, if you think of it as a potluck, they decided they were going to make a book. They were each responsible for their own choir. Um, and you can see what I'm showing you now is the sort of the, um, the colophons at the back of each signature saying like the signature was printed by the, the Pitson printers. Um, I'll, I'm not going to read all of them, but you can sort of see what happens. So that the, the book is not a... Well, bibliography doesn't deal well with sample bands anyway, but is it, a collect it is a collectively produced book with the explicit aim in this instance of um, talking about women in the printing industry. Uh, it's, it's, it's lovely. I, would, I, would, I own the first choir, but I'm really fascinated, really love this book. Um, there's, oh, Our Bodies Ourselves. I'm, I just realized I, I skipped a whole thing where I wanted to talk about mutual aid. I'll come back to that in one second. Um, Our Bodies Ourselves, which is another good example of a book that emerged from a community, um, the Boston Women's Health Collective in the late 60s was a group that was formed in order to learn more about women's health. Their doctors weren't meeting their needs, uh, not surprisingly, part, sort of par for the course. Um, in that period, perhaps, but these women got together and I said, well, we're going to, we're going to gather together all of our knowledge and all of our research and um, create a booklet that we can disseminate to women. But what I really love about this is that the first edition, um, the first edition was printed by the New England, uh, New England Free Press, Boston Women's Collective wrote it, they hired the free press to print it. It went through a lot of printings. It was much more successful than they were expecting it to be. And they decided in part because of this um, huge demand for this text that, and right above my head, you can see this is a letter from um, the 
back of the, the back of the edition, there's a letter from the authors that says, uh, we decide we're gonna, we're gonna publish this with Simon & Schuster, who continues to, to publish the book today. And here's the arrangement that we've made for, with them. And we're still gonna have lots of dedicated copies for clinics and all this sort of um, good radical lefty stuff that the collective believed in. But what's really fabulous is you turn the page over and the New England Free Press has a response saying, no, we think this is a bad idea. And I love that this, this book argues against itself, that there are so many voices happening in it and that um, they included this, this, this response from the printer um, as a way of, even though they disagreed with that. Um, so I wanna, I wanna I, think about the sort of communities that arise out of these books. And one of the things that I wanna point out, particularly about the Boston Women's Collective, um, is something that I see a lot in America in the last handful of years. I don't know what it's like in other countries. There's been um, an increased awareness of mutual aid and the ways in which we can help our communities help, its, help ourselves as opposed to waiting for government or for nonprofit charities to come in and, and um, rescue us from things. And one of the reasons I'm interested in mutual aid, and I wanted to mention it here, is they have a very different notion of how to approach problems and how to um, find resolutions. So in typical, in typical uh, charity structures, um, there's a, the, the person is made to feel, the person who's asking for help um, is often made to feel ashamed that they need help. This is a super, you know, American, pull up your bootstraps. Other countries have different metaphors, I'm sure. But that sense of, if you're poor, it's your fault. Like you did something wrong. How come you haven't worked 20 hours a day so you have enough food to eat? But with mutual aid, the premise isn't the problem with an individual. The premise is that there are structural inequalities. And so it's not your fault that you don't have childcare or that your health services aren't meeting your needs as a trans individual or that um, you don't have enough money to eat. The problems are the systems that we live in that have set up structures that have gotten in the way. And so instead of treating people who don't know things as um, somehow being inadequate, it welcomes people in and say, you can help us understand what's happening in the world. You can help us. You are part of this project. We are gonna make things better together. And so I wonder in part, if when we think about bibliography and we think about bringing people into the community, um, we can think about it in terms of what they can contribute to us as opposed to what do they not know? What do we not, what do we have to teach them that they are behind on, but what can they open our eyes to and how can they teach us to strengthen our practices? It's a much more inclusive way. Uh, so I'll just end with saying that I think thinking about bibliography from a feminist perspective, from a liberatory perspective, um, is really consistent with what I see as sort of a mutual aid ethos um, in which it is open to everyone and it is a practice that can help us build communities that lift us all up together. And to remember that um, when we think of bibliography, we think of bookshelves that look like this right? All those little old books. And that's what bibliography so far has been doing. Um, but bookshelves also look like this. And maybe we should spend a little bit more time with the people who write and read um, and produce these books um, and see what directions that takes us in for the future. Thank you. Right, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that provocative and exciting talk. Um, uh, as you might have seen in the chat, please uh, put your questions into the chat box, um, because on my screen, there is no Q&A <laughs> um, available. And, um, and let me just ask a first question here. Um, I, you ended with the word inclusive bibliography. You began with feminist uh, bibliography that's in your title and you you define feminism very broadly um, in ways that I think are are, are especially helpful. Um, but 
I think it's fair to say not just mine, but our feminism, yours and mine at least, evolved in a binary world in which there were two options. There was male and there was female. And you, you check the box. Now there are other boxes. This is a non-binary world we are living in. Um, and so does feminism carry over that, calling it feminist bibliography, does that carry over that binary structuring um, that sends a signal that is different from what you're actually telling us you're doing, which is inclusive or intersectional? Um, there, alternative there there could be lots of um interesting and alternate alternative labels for what you are doing so yeah. i wonder if you could talk to us a little bit more about the advantages as well as the disadvantages of of describing this as feminist thank you for that that's such a good question and it's one that i'm still sort of wrestling with i do wonder sometimes um when I define my feminism so expansively, if it sort of loses all meaning. Um, and I don't want it to do that. I do, I do really believe that, well, so gender, gender is what I'm interested in. It was back when I thought it was a binary world um, and it continues to be now that I see the world and gender as having um, a much greater spectrum of possibilities than what there used to be. Um, that's just what that we all we all have areas that we gravitate to right and lenses that we see and that's mine. But I also think is really important as a feminist, I really believe that if we don't keep talking about gender and about women or people who are not men i'm not sure I, I sort of like want to do like everybody except for cis men. Um, it gets dropped gender as a category of analysis disappears. Um, I don't think that's good, but I think it's really easy for it to happen. And I've seen it happen in, in our time over the last couple of, last handful of decades in Renaissance studies, which is both what, what, what Valerie and I do, um, right? That there are moments where people are like, oh, right, we did feminism, now we don't have to talk about gender anymore. And so I want it to still be at the, at the forefront um, of that category of analysis, but I do, I do really, really strongly believe that feminism and gender shouldn't be something that only women are interested in. Being being right. being male is also a gender, and I think that 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 feminist bibliography could consider gender as a category writ largely, and can also think more about how um, the maleness of books or bibliography or anything like that. There certainly is a large legacy to <laughs> to address and move beyond. Um, and you really made that quite clear um, in your examples. Um, a question for Marissa Young. Um, thank you so much. Are there major differences between bibliographies written by librarians with literature backgrounds and bibliographies written by scholars with art history backgrounds? super interesting so i don't know i actually what i part of what i don't know is how much sort of bibliographical training you get if your discipline is art history mm -hmm. and maybe mm -hmm. somebody in the audience or maybe i Marissa, i don't know if you are an art historian um can drop in the chat or raise your hand to share something about that um but my my sense is that um, text, te that different as different fields involved in the larger field of bibliography and book history don't necessarily tend to talk to each other. So historians don't necessarily talk a lot with the textual scholars, bibliographers, and the literature scholars don't tend to talk a lot with the art historians, even when art historians are working on engravings or illustrations or other things that occur in books. Um, so I don't have an answer to your question, but I'm really curious about it. Okay, that was from Marissa Young. Um, Claire O'Hanlon has provided, I think it's her, a great list of trans feminist approaches and readings that might be helpful. Awesome. Um, yeah, that really, really could be great. Um, I, one thing I'll, I'll mention is that um, there, I don't know, it's probably not on there and I obviously haven't looked at it, um, there is a graduate student now at 
University of Illinois who's um, getting going on a dissertation um, that's going to be fascinating. Uh, his name's Caden Henningsen. Um, and Caden is a sort of former librarian and also a printer and is, is thinking about what a, a sort of like trans approach to book history would be and whether what's sort of like how we gender and how we don't gender books and could we think of books themselves as trans objects and um, as somebody who's really excited about sort of like material texts. I'm really interested in ways in, in how we might think about sort of like how a book presents it or how we attribute gender to objects. That, that might be another form of um, liberation bibliography. In some way. Yeah, I think so. I mean, this is one of the things that I really love about um, Derek Spires is um, expression of liberation bibliography is that it's, just, it's really exciting and it's also capacious in a really wonderful way um, that yeah. lots of what I'm interested in can, can fit into that. Um, and I'll just shout out that um, his talk is on the BSA, the Bibliographical Society of America YouTube channel. And there will be a version of it coming out in print in the March 22, March 2022 issue of um, PBSA. So then we'll all oh, be able to read it and cite it and we can talk about Derek as our new. It was a great talk. Yeah. It really was wonderful. Yeah. Um, Deborah Leslie asks, does Marissa mean art history bibliographies of books, or is the question thinking of catalogs resume? Probably, probably the latter, right? I, I, I don't, you know, and it's one of those things I do, and I'm guilty of this too, I don't spend enough time in art history land to really have a grasp of those practices. Okay. Um, oh, thank you for dropping the LinkedIn page. That's great. Okay. okay. Um, this, is, this is an impossible thing to do, but do you have any estimate at all of how much is left out of the STC because of the exclusion of materials that were printed on a rolling press? I mean, it would just, it's, so the it's, thing it's that I, 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 I don't, and I feel like if we poke around, we could probably find people who do. I and mean, so one of the things that's confusing about the ESTC is that it's a um, a weird animal of multiple catalogs got switched into one catalog, um, and so the sh the the short title catalog, the Pollard and Redgrave SDC, which goes to sixteen forty includes book plates, I think, not book, you know, like book, um, book labels, I think, if I'm remembering this correctly, um, it definitely includes periodicals, it includes, um, why can't I remember those, indulgences is the other word I'm looking for, indulgences, but then when you get to the wing catalog, which is 1640 to 1700, I think Think that might be when periodicals stop being included. And then once you get to the 18th century, they have another set of rules. So it's, it's a little bit confusing to work out. So sometimes you do see um, things in one category. And I don't, I don't know. I don't know what the answer to that, to that is. Um, and, and I will say the other, the other thing that I'm really curious about, and if anyone has any idea this already exists out there, please let me know. I've slowly, so I've been rereading Freds and Bowers because that's what you do. And <laughs> this time I got really curious about the examples that he gives in the book to sort of illustrate what he's talking about. So when he's talking about um, how do you know whether this is a different state or if it's a new issue, he'll be like, well, of course, when you look at Musidorus, Blah, 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 whatever it is he's quoting. And he just drops these names as if you know what he's talking about. But so I got sort of interested in tracking the examples that he uses in his book to see what's not in it. And I would love it if it turned out that somebody had already done that work because it's a little bit tedious doing now. But I got interested in part because Liza Blake, who's been doing some really interesting work on Margaret Cavendish, and also has a piece on Cavendish and her bindings coming out in, in the March issue of PBSA. Um, she pointed out that despite the fact that 
Cavendish's books are bibliographically really complicated, some of them, because they get issued in multiple states and the preliminaries move around all over. Um, and Bowers mentions Cavendish in the side by one, like briefly mentions her and that's it. Otherwise doesn't talk about her. Um, so I'm really curious about um, what else is not in there. Well, thank you for sending us so such wonderful work um, <laughs> uh, through the essay as well, and for giving us so much um, at this conference. Um, I think we're just about out of time. Um, uh, Philippa Price says, thank you, Sarah. Advocating inclusiveness is great, but can you can we break the tight circle formulary of Bowers and Gaskell? Is anyone doing it like Spires could? Field expertise and open access use, uh, digital accessibility, open bibliography up. Um, you 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 have sixty seconds for this answer. <laughs> Perfect. Because I don't okay. know how to say more than that. Um, okay. So the the thing that, that I um, there are lots of people trying to think about the the 20th and 21st century printing technologies and how those can fit into the Bowers world. Um, I am not really aware of a lot of work that is not Bowersian. I'm not sure if that's the adjective form. Um, and I will say that one of the things that that Spires does is he's not doing formularies. He's not interested really in descriptive bibliography the way that I've been talking about it. Um, Derek is much more interested in what I would describe as print culture um, in the in the work when he's talking about with liberation bibliography. Um, I do really hope that, that there will be something soon that people will, because people working in the 20th century, your life is hard because there's no juggling all these different forms. There needs to be some practices illuminated. I don't know who's doing it right now, hopefully soon. Thank you so much, Sarah. We are out of time, but we've had a wonderful hour and 15 minutes. Thank you very much. And thank you all for your questions. Um, I hope you continue to have a wonderful conference.